So good morning. My name is Caroline Poe. I'm a neurologist in the Lausanne University Hospital. It's a pleasure to be here today with you, and I'm very happy that we could conduct this, this symposium today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today uh, Professor Thomas Berger here with us. Uh, he is a professor of neurology and chair of neurology at the Medical University of Vienna in, in Austria. Uh, he was trained as a neurologist in Austria with a very strong expertise in MS. So it's a really a great honor to have him today. He's also very much uh, involved in the neurology community. So he's the president of the Austrian Neurology Society. He's also very much involved at the EN. He's a chair of the scientific committee. He has been also very much involved with organizing the ECTRIM, so the, this very important Congress for us. Um, I, the next ECTRIMS Congress will again be in Vienna, so it's a pleasure to have you. And um, so now we will uh, hear you talk. So we go from the other spectrum, from the children to the elderly, but I think it's a very, very challenging and also important topic in our field today. So we are really keen to hear you, Thomas Berger, with the MS in the elderly, immunosenescence and implication for management. Caroline, thank you very much for this very kind uh, introduction. And I'm uh, very happy to be with you and also have been invited uh, to your symposium. Um, uh, definitely, as you said, this stretches from the one end of our life uh, to the not other end, but at least to a more mature step. And um, uh, this is why it's called MS in the elderly, immunosenescence and implications for management. First, I need to um, uh, disclose um, my uh, uh, contributions, uh, which I've got from various companies. However, uh, I have to say that these uh, disclosures have no uh, impact on the today's uh, lecture at all. Now, if we if we start thinking about aging itself, then it's uh, trivial. But I think we need to remind uh, us permanently because nobody has achieved so far of getting younger. So we are all um, uh, it's all clear for us that it's an inevitable truth for us that we are aging uh, day by day, minute by minute. The other point is, I think, and this is sometimes a little bit uh, depressing, that aging leads to a sort of accumulation of knowledge, wisdom, experience, etc., but definitely also with impaired biological function, declining health, and last but not least, by fading away because of our, um, let's say, mortality uh, clock, which is definitely a part of our life. However, we need to also uh, admit that uh, at the given time point, the matter of uh, or the, the components of the aging processes are not uh, quite well understood. Um, if we now uh, turn more in detail to the aging and the aging of our immune uh, uh, system, then um, of course this uh, uh, is not only uh, very strongly related to the immune system, it's a general aspect that um, aging includes uh, or is due to uh, throughout the lifespan accumulating processes which are driven either by genetic or epigenetic uh, instability of alterations. Uh, one obviously very important um, uh, action is the telomere attrition, uh, just as depicted on the right side of the, of the, of the slide. Well, we are facing uh, as an organism uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, but also stem cell exhaustion. So uh, everything what has to do with repair, regeneration, is uh, slowly but definitely declining over the lifespan. There is also, uh, I think, uh, together with this, uh, changes in the cellular environment, uh, nutritional factors, but also intracellular communication. And 
uh, which is also a fate of not only the whole organism, but also if we tie it down to tissues or cells, that they are also um, uh, senescent and the many other um, uh, processes involved. So as I said, uh, with specific uh, emphasis on the immunosenescence, this um, defines the aging of our immune system. And one of the uh, very important features of immunosenescence is the development of a so-called uh, low-grade inflammation, which is defined as inflammaging. And I think this is also a matter which is, uh, as uh, Caroline already um, mentioned, I think a growing interest, not only in the understanding uh, how our uh, organism, how our body, how our life is uh, aging and which processes are linked to this, but also to understand how we uh, to one point can counteract because this is a definitely seminal wish of all humans on the one hand. But on the other hand, it might also be that there are processes which resemble a kind of premature senescence uh, in uh, uh, association with certain diseases, including multiple sclerosis. And therefore, of course, it might be also helpful to think about this inflammaging and the contribution um, to the progression of the disease itself. And I don't want to bore you. Uh, I just want to give you a glimpse. Uh, and probably this is a completely um, um, uh, incomplete list of uh, activities uh, along with aging on our immune system, various compartments, cellular compartments, um, uh, and other compartments of our uh, immune system, which are prone of uh, aging and therefore contribute to the immunosenescence. And, uh, and this is shown by the graph on the right side, uh, as I already mentioned before, uh, apart from the, of course, uh, uh, um, activities and also this, uh, the, the search for understanding this process is better. Um, is just one um, uh, goal, but the other goal is, of course, and I, I, I call it in this way, kind of uh, attempt of rejuvenation. And as I said, this is a, a, an old uh, or an ever human wish of to re rejuvenile. Uh, but on the other hand, um, um, uh, I think it's also under, uh, important, uh, as I said, with the uh, association to a potentially, especially inflammatory driven uh, chronic disease to understand these processes and at various time points or at various uh, uh, cross marks of these processes, try to intervene. And this is just an, uh, uh, giving examples on which kind of uh, cellular levels uh, uh, we could try to intervene, be it on the uh, stem cell uh, level, be it on the thymus level, be it on the B or T cell level itself, or on other um, uh, cellular components and immune processes which uh, are involved in either promoting uh, chronic uh, uh, inflammation like the microglia uh, level or also on a uh, level of cells which are uh, generally involved in repair and regeneration, like obviously, uh, for example, oligodendrocytes or also in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells. So uh, having said that, it is the question, how does this regard to multiple sclerosis? And I think there is one uh, um, uh, at the, at the first glance, not that obvious, because we always say that uh, MS is the disease of the younger adults. Uh, but this is definitely true, but it's also definitely true uh, for the vast majority regarding the onset of the disease. And uh, given the fact that, of course, uh, over the past decades, the, uh, let's say, caregiving uh, for MS has dramatically advanced, and uh, therefore, of course, uh, people have more or less the same uh, survival rate than any other um, uh, population which means that it accounts for the fact that uh, the majority of our MS patients in our MS clinics or in our offices are around the age of 50. So I don't want to say that 50 is already an elderly person. Uh, this uh, 
uh, would uh, that then I have to account for myself that I'm uh, not elderly but already old. But uh, nevertheless, in a biological sense, of course, uh, the age of 50 or 55 is definitely already uh, advanced um, 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 uh, or advanced maturation of being an adult. And uh, the graphs, and this is just to, to depict some, um, some examples, clearly show that the that there's a clear increase in the in the age of our MS population, which is on the one hand extremely lucky because it means that, as I said, the survival has uh, definitely improved over the last decades. On the other hand, it also uh, uh, poses a, a, a couple of challenges in the management uh, of our MS patients, even in the daily base. One clear fact is that age is related with the change in the disease um, activity in general. On the one hand, of course, we all know already from the old uh, natural history studies that um, the inflammation is decreasing over duration of the disease, which more or less is in parallel with, uh, a, uh, with an increase of age, biological age. So uh, this is not only recognized on the clinical uh, level by uh, decreasing relapse rates, it's also on the MRI level. There is a very nice study um, uh, showing the uh, results from several studies, especially in um, uh, progressive uh, 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 disease cases or uh, uh, study populations, and it's very clearly seen that the, the number of GAD enhancing lesions is also uh, decreasing, and this is in parallel as we can observe on the clinical uh, point of view. Another important uh, observation uh, along with relapses is that the functional recovery also decreases, which means, uh, uh, to say it in a very easy way, the younger you are, the more likely that you have a complete recovery or remission after your relapse, and the older you get, uh, the more the risk that um, this will be incomplete. And last but not least, as a, a very important hallmark of our uh, clinical phenotypes and uh, uh, disease uh, development is, of course, accumulating uh, disability due to uh, ongoing disease progression. And it's obviously that age plays an important role on the one hand, and on the other hand, that also, if you compare MS patients to normal uh, population at the same age, which means age matched, then um, it's clear that the MS patients have a kind of premature association of the link of their increase of disability due to their age. And this uh, is, I think, a very important observation because this also uh, poses uh, several imminent, um, um, imminent questions. And just to give you another example, because biomarker research is, of course, also since many years on the top hot topics uh, in MS research, and uh, especially, for example, the neurofilaments, but this accounts also very well, this study, uh, to what I said before, that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the increase uh, or that the serum levels of uh, neurofilaments are definitely age dependent, which is very important also not only for formal reasons to establish, let's say, normal values and ranges uh, according to age matched uh, group, it also accounts for the fact that obviously there is an age-dependent increase of neuroaxonal damage for whatever reason, and this again may also have a huge impact uh, in, a, in a chronic disease like MS, because then two, uh, two important factors which contribute to, a pay, uh, to, to an individual um, disease progression um, are uh, more or less summarized uh, or definitely accumulating. Uh, <clears throat> There's also uh, uh, some studies going on showing that some of these um, uh, processes of, um, of immunosenescence or aging in general are also um, um, uh, uh, seen in MS patients, which is on the first glance, of course, uh, self-explaining because if they get older, they are also likely to have age-dependent uh, changes. But it seems that this is also very strongly uh, linked like the 
telomere length uh, uh, to a development of uh, uh, impairments or disability as measured by the EDSS. So it could be that the one causes the other or at least facilitates or triggers the other. Definitely, there is a link and association between uh, the longer disease duration and uh, the, uh, the uh, getting older of uh, the person with multiple sclerosis. Nevertheless, uh, and we all are aware that the inflammatory part in MS from the neuropathological view, but also from uh, immunopathogenetical view is, let's say, the more easier part. The much more difficult part is the neurobiology or neuropathology of um, neurodegeneration and neuroaxonal damage. And this has many several influencing factors, uh, be it on the, let's say, uh, uh, slowly burning uh, chronic inflammation mediated by microglia, for example, but it also is um, linked to oxidative burst, to uh, oxidative radicals, to mitochondrial dis function to iron storage, which on the other hand is also a kind of obvious matter in the aging of an individual per se. So obviously, again, and this is what I want to draw your attention, that there are two, um, uh, two factors. The one is the disease factor and one is the aging factor are uh, coming together and probably also uh, in a way influencing the chronicity of the disease to a certain extent. And this is just a summary of this, um, uh, let's say, neuropathologically uh, defined uh, term of the uh, ongoing slowly uh, inflammatory process, which is called smoldering uh, lesional uh, process, which it, nothing else than characterizes this very slow over years um, uh, expanding uh, inflammation, which is probably not that recognized by our classical clinical, but also radiological means, and is very strongly um, uh, uh, driven by those processes on the on the uh, on the on the uh, inflammatory, but also on the uh, oxidative mitochondrial iron um, storage, etc. Uh, level in general. So um, I think, that, and I would like to draw your attention and recommend this very nice um, publication out of the group from Ohun Kantarci, uh, who says that obviously uh, age is a very important factor also in the uh, in the development of disease progression per se. It's not only the neuropathological process, it's also the aging process. And that we have to draw our attention also to the matters and to the side effects and to the along with aging and to draw your, our attention in whatever we can prevent in aging processes might also be beneficial for preventing uh, disease progression in MS. And of course, there are two uh, very important factors. The one factor is uh, that with uh, uh, getting older, it also means accumulation of potentially concomitant disorders. And uh, these are just, again, two examples showing that uh, MS patients in an age-dependent way do uh, accumulate concomitant disorders. And this has not only an impact on the physical uh, well-being, it has an impact on the use of various medications. Uh, it is the polypharmacy, but it also regards, of course, the use of disease-modifying therapy, which are, of course, intended uh, in the, let's say, mainly inflammatory phase of multiple sclerosis and may also interfere either with other treatments or with factors uh, uh, of a uh, growing age, including potentially risks and also including potentially contraindications uh, due to uh, the concomitant uh, disorders. And um, this age factor or age as a certain risk was very clearly also demasked during the pandemic. And um, there was a, a, a high grade of uncertainty at the very beginning of the pandemic two years ago, when we were not quite clear whether MS patients are per se at risk for a SARS-CoV-2 infection or even a more severe 
uh, COVID-19 uh, disease course. But it turned out very quickly, and this was, I think, a very good uh, international consensus because evidence was lacking, but the consensus was there that uh, more or less MS patients have the same risk factors as any other uh, uh, individual, um, uh, which is uh, driven by obesity, cardiovascular disorders, other concomitant disorders, diabetes, etc. And uh, there is only one very specific issue also in MS patients is if they have a higher degree on uh, disability. This again accounts, of course, for uh, impaired mobility and therefore for the risk of getting infections in general and therefore also for SARS-CoV-2 uh, disease. And um, this is just an example, but we have been trying to establish a kind of risk factor. And this was at the given time point last year important also for our national activities, but I think it was more or less in every country in the same way um, uh, to prioritize also the vaccinations to people at risk. And therefore, we also developed this risk factor uh, to keep an eye on those patients and again, elderly patients uh, in general, which are more likely at risk and therefore also were uh, at least a year ago, more uh, likely also to um, um, jump up in the prioritization list for vaccinations. And last but not least, the last two minutes I would spend for the disease-modifying therapies MS. You all are aware that we have a plethora of a, a enlarging spectrum of disease-modifying therapies, which are indicated to various uh, disease courses or phenotypes. And the, 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 the light blue are the highlighted new uh, European um, uh, medicines agency approvals in the years 2020 and 21. We are also, uh, uh, I think, uh, very clearly um, uh, have notified and are aware that these treatments are all anti-inflammatory treatments and therefore, of course, are most likely to be effective in the inflammatory phase. So it's not really wondering that the older the patient gets and the lesser by natural history or by aging factors, this kind of uh, inflammation, which is so typical for the early phase in MS, is declining. And therefore, it's self-explaining that the treatments are probably not exerting the same effect in the later phases as compared to the earlier phases. We all, I think, are quite aware of that in a very clear way. It's also difficult, and this is also in regard with the new approvals in uh, progressive disease uh, patients is to evaluate the effectiveness of those treatments because the, 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 it's easy to, to judge if a treatment is working if the patient improves in symptoms, in disability as measured on the EDSS. It's also easy to judge if it fails because if the patient continues to worsen in the same way. But the majority is probably in between. So a little bit of worsening or a little bit of improvement over years is this accounting for the effectiveness of the drug or has this any other influencing factors? And by the side effect profile, and this again regards uh, brings us back to the immunosenescence, definitely there are changes in the immune system as alluded before. And um, for example, this was uh, from the DMF study showing that the elderly the patient or the older the patient get, the more likely are uh, lymphopenic uh, uh, reactions due to immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive drugs, which accounts for a very easy um, uh, easy uh, um, situation, those patients, because of their age, are probably more likely of getting side effects on the one hand, or on the other hand, also a lesser uh, effective uh, treatment mode of action, again, due to the age and especially due to immunosenescence. And I just want to remind you about uh, one of the uh, uh, most um, um, uh, anxiety causing and uh, um, uh, prominent uh, side effects, PML. And there's um, a couple of studies, uh, especially also regarding in association with natalizumab, showing that the elderly the patients are, the more likely or the more 
likely or higher the risk is for a PML. And this also if accounts for other treatments associated with PML, be it fingolimod DMF or one single case in ocrelizumab, I think which is a very extreme case. But if you look at the uh, at the mean age of those patients, they are not uh, resembling the classical uh, early um, uh, treatment or uh, early disease phase patients. So again, it uh, points to the fact that age might be also a contributing factor for certain uh, adverse events or risks uh, along with our disease modifying therapies. So having said that, I would like to conclude that aging is a matter which uh, is important for all of us uh, in, in any way, but uh, it might also be that it's specifically important for patients with a chronic disease because the factors contributing to aging, uh, especially also to immunosenescence, may not only be a factor important for the decision-making in regard to disease-modifying therapies or uh, even immunosuppressive therapies, but may also account to a substantial, uh, uh, in a substantial way also to the disease progression itself. So I think uh, apart from just um, treating our patients with a disease modifying therapy and probably thinking about uh, the age of the patient and taking into account potential benefit risk evaluations, we also need to take into account that a general brain health uh, attitude and also probably preventive strategies, as with many other, uh, not only disorders, but also normal uh, uh, persons and individuals to uh, have as long as much, uh, as much as long, a healthy, uh, especially also uh, neurologically healthy life, uh, strongly also accounts for patients with chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking very forward to any questions. Dear yeah, Thomas, thank you very much for this very comprehensive and very clear presentation from the biology to the clinical application. Um, the audience can really ask questions still yet, so we have one question in the chat. Um, do MS patients with disease-modifying treatment have the same risk to develop stroke or atherosclerosis? And as the treatment of inflammation decreases its risk? So the link between DMTs, um, stroke, cardiovascular diseases. Yeah, uh, a very good question, because I think you could answer it in, in various ways. On the one hand, we know that stroke or let's say risk factors for stroke also include chronic inflammation. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, we always thought that patients with MS have a definitely lower risk of, um, of any uh, concomitant disorders, including cardiovascular disorders in regard to the age-matched control groups. But I think with the recognition that uh, our uh, MS population is growing older, we also recognize that, uh, of course, uh, they have probably not the same risk, but they have a, at least a not neglectable risk uh, as compared to age match controls. And therefore, I think we need to explore much more whether, and this will happen the next 10, 15 years down the road, whether our disease-modifying therapies, which are definitely anti-inflammatory, will also have a, a, a beneficial impact on the, let's say, at least one part inflammatory contribution to atherosclerosis. Thank you. I think it was a very clear answer to this unknown field yet, almost. Um, another question is, what is your strategy in starting or de-escalating highly active therapy in elderly patients? This is also a good uh, question because, of course, this is an obvious also question. This has not only uh, is not 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 only influenced by pure regulatory uh, issues, because at the end of the day, uh, for most of the therapies, um, uh, there is an upper limit of uh, age 55. So if we continue, we more or less continue on an off-label basis. But nevertheless, again, I think this is a very individual decision on the one hand. 
And on the other hand, uh, we need to also uh, establish more clear evidence because at the moment we have only more or less gut feelings. There are studies going on, especially in patients with um, progressive disease, which is not exactly the same question, but the likelihood that these, those patients are the more advanced regarding age is likely. I personally um, uh, uh, think that, again, if the phenotype is, um, is uh, clearly indicating inflammatory activity, age is not a restrictive factor or a limiting factor. So uh, if somebody is 70 and has, although we all know very rarely, but even if this patient would have a clear relapsing disease course, I think then, of course, an anti-inflammatory treatment probably with a more uh, view on potentially the side effects, but this is the same also in the younger patients, as we heard before from Brenda Benwell. Um, but again, the driving idea is the anti-inflammatory activity. If I'm not sure any more about uh, inflammation and the impact of an anti-inflammatory therapy, then I think we should try to fade it out. But I th to be sure, we need more evidence for that. And do you think we could use biomarkers to define age, biological age? I mean, you mentioned urofilament, telomere, 54, 55 is a very difficult Yes, number. definitely. No, very good question. And I think it, it is not only in regard to MS. I think it would be a very strong general um, general important aspect in uh, probably managing a lot of various um, diseases, but also health function in itself. And I just want to come back again to the pandemic. Um, I think it, we learned a lot also on the on the risk factors, on the uh, recovery factors, on the factors why severity is uh, in elderly patients or in patients with impaired immune uh, uh, system or with disorders impairing immune system. So we're learning a lot, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And MS would be, again, a model disease. I, I would predict a model disease to study those effects not only along with the aging of the patient, but especially with the view on how does this pre-mature immunosenescence, the alteration uh, of the immunosenescence, uh, the, 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 the maturation of the immune system has an impact on the disease progression itself. And maybe the last question before we stop, um, what well, you, you presented the risk of PML at the end of your presentation. So what are alternatives for patients who are positive for GCV and older than 50? Do you take this in account in your elderly population in your cohorts? You know, uh, it's, always, uh, it's always nice to be wiser than the Pope. Yeah? But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, but at the end of the day, I, 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 I suspect, and I can't prove it, but I suspect that many of those patients probably do not have a clear-cut indication for this therapy. You know, the, 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 the peak of this group is this 78-year-old uh, uh, Ocrelizumab patient. I doubt that this patient uh, never ever needed a disease-modifying therapy and then started with uh, ocrelizumab at the age of 76 or something like that. You know, I, I, again, it's easy to say because we are exposed to pressures of our patients and um, also to our own pressure of uh, trying to deliver a treatment solution to an individual, no doubt. But again, I think if we are not sure that the inflammatory activity is prevailing clinically or on MRI, at best with both, then I don't think that any of those therapies are really of, uh, of use. And then we have the problem, the worst case scenario, which means um, a wrong indication, but maximum then side effects or harm. <laughs> Well, thank you for these very wise and uh, uh, advices, uh, putting us back in the, in the middle of this very important question.